It's well, here we are yet again. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. At you know, I know you're waking up watching us right now. It's, it's almost as if I'm hosting like a morning show, except it's about entrepreneurship. And that's kind of how this has felt for seven weeks. Each time we say, Hey, how you doing? Hope you're waking up with us. Hope you're taking something from this. Enjoy your day. Well, here we are, week seven. I hope you've taken something from us over the last six weeks. I assure you that today you've seen me fired up, but today we're going to get really fired up because we're talking about mindset. And for all the entrepreneurs out there, we've heard your stories. How do you persevere? What are you going through? How do you find funding? Do your business plan? All of these questions have tried to be answered, but today's the best part because whether those questions were answered or not, today's the day we give away $13,000 and we start that process. So if you didn't get anything from it, at least you're gonna get some seed money and you're gonna get started and you're gonna have all of these resources to support you. Again, I'm your host, Zach Hall. We're here tonight. We got an incredible State 48 Foundation. Just one time for everybody in the room for the State 48 Foundation. Look what we did. We're at the uh, Center for Entrepreneurial Innovation in downtown Phoenix yet again. We can't say thank you to, enough to all of them for being incredible partners, inviting us into this space and allowing us to get started in this hybrid virtual format and just kind of figuring out what we're doing. And the stories we've heard again, um, Instagram DMs, you've heard me make tons of jokes about it, but it works. And now we're seeing like, wow, like these are people that want to get connected with State 48. They want to get connected with our speakers. And our speakers, Sarah from No Women Lab, oh my good, she gave $2,500 and just gives me chills again that she came into the State 48 brand. She said, I love what you guys are doing. I love this foundation. How can I do more? And wrote a $2,500 check and it cleared. And that's the best part. Because <laughs> I said sometimes like, oh, I'm good for it. And I probably wasn't, but I'm working on that too. <laughs> so again, you know, we've had some incredible sponsors of this whole thing. And tonight, one of our speakers has been an incredible sponsor with the Soul Pod. Uh, the Phoenix Biomedical Campus, uh, they hit a home run for us. And we started with maybe $1,000, $2,000 in grant money. But because of your stories and the questions being asked, some incredible entrepreneurs and leaders in this community have stepped up to say, hey, I want to be a small part of that. And it just gives me a lot of inspiration on, on what I know we can do with the speaker series moving forward. I've already talked to the boss at Mike Spank. That's his handle. If you're trying to DM him, he's tough to get a hold of, but you can get on his calendar. We have some really cool ideas for how this is going to evolve into 2022. And that's because of all of you and everyone in this room. So just Again, I can't say thank you enough that we went through seven weeks talking about what we thought we needed to bring to entrepreneurs and that's marketing and fundraising and things like that. But we have a whole nother plethora of ideas and, and speakers are saying, hey, I think I can add value to something you haven't talked about. So be prepared for more to come in 2022. So for those of you, again, coming up to speed with the, with the nonprofit, everyone's familiar with State 48. It's been an incredible launch of the brand. Week one, we talked to Mike and Nick and we heard that story of how it started in the garage and $500. Sounds like a lot of you. And that's what's been cool to hear is look where State 48 is now. And in launching the foundation um, a year and a half ago, we had this incredible diverse community of maybe this guy works over here and this woman works here and she's got this experience. And our board was formed. And we had all these ideas of ways that we wanted to get to work, but we were in a pandemic and we didn't know how in-person events were going to go. We didn't know how virtual events. We did our virtual kickoff last November, December, and we did it virtually. And we raised $15,000, $16,000 having never done a virtual event before. Things like that, all of you continue to blow us away. And that's the coolest part about being a part of this community. You know, um, in this final installment, you know, we're gonna talk to a guy, his name's Templeton Walker. He does some really cool stuff in this community and I'll take it back for you. You know, I like to talk about being from the avenues and growing up over in Maryvale, all these things. And you know, when you're, you grow up, you know, in the neighborhood, you sometimes you like to play pickup basketball. Well. I got crossed and, and you could probably guess why I got crossed. So fast forward, I'm at community college and Templeton was playing another community college and our paths crossed and it was about sports at that point. But then fast forward 15 years, here we are with State 48 Foundation and here's Templeton doing his thing with Soul Pod and his investments and real estate. And we're gonna hear his story and most importantly, his energy. And tonight's all about mindset and learning from your mistakes. I think the coolest part about Templeton, who's gonna be our first guest tonight, is just how vulnerable and honest he is about his mistakes. And he's turned it into his business and continued to give and give and give. And if you heard us last week, Sarah, her greatest lesson was give, 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 and then it'll come back to you. And even if it doesn't, you're gonna feel great about the giving. So without further ado, thank you guys so much for being here. Just know that you've made it this far. The grants were gonna be open next week and they're gonna be open for about two weeks. We can get some ideas of what you're looking for. Submit your applications. That'll go out tomorrow or the next day. You'll have two weeks to fill it out and then we're giving away $13,000. So the man who's helped us get to that number without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Templeton Walker.
How oh, are you? Fine, right? In front. Um, my name's Templeton. I, uh, I'm from a small town. I'm from the Grand Canyon National Park, and I was born, born and raised in a community of about 1,500 people. So that did a couple things for me. It uh, let me be a big fish in a small pond and gave me way too much confidence in a good way. Right? I thought I was the man. To, to uh, Zach's point, I got to play some college basketball. And in high school, I was averaging 25, 30 points a game, playing small school basketball. I go to college and I was like, oh my God, I'm not that good at basketball. These guys were so much better than me. So uh, by Christmas of that freshman year, I uh, made a baby. I found out I was going to have my first son. I was like, oh my goodness, life is coming at me fast. I had a giant tumor thing in my neck. I thought I might have cancer. And I remember praying to God and saying, God, if you don't give me cancer, I will be the best father you've ever seen. So no cancer. And I will say, I've been a really good father. However, from 19 to 25, I floundered. I had 34 different jobs, 34, pretty unemployable. And it wasn't that I wasn't kind hearted or hardworking or sweet natured. Like I had all those in me, but I really just didn't understand that I couldn't suffer a fool's errand at that time, or I really needed to go to the beat of my own drum. And I had had this programming that told me I needed to go down a certain path. Um, I always talk about our education system and a lot of times entrepreneurship and our workforce, the, the tests or the, the objective is to climb a tree, to use an analogy. And there's a lion, there's a bear and an elephant and the lion scurries up the tree and he's so talented. The bear scurries up the tree, so talented. And I was like the elephant, I couldn't get up the tree, but they were testing me on the wrong metric, right? Like they weren't testing me on being strong or powerful or moving water or whatever else elephants do really well, have great memories. Um, but I had never had someone put finance, money and business in front of me. I had only had plate tectonics and algebra and like stuff that I was like, I literally don't know what they're talking about. But when someone put a profit and loss statement in front of me and marketing and a sales funnel, my brain came alive and I started devouring books. So because I had my son so early, I didn't get to finish college. I guess I could have in hindsight, but I chose not to. I chose to move to the Valley and start working on being a father and starting to make some means. So from 19 to 25, I floundered, right? I, I was job to job. But what I did start doing at 25 is I looked in the mirror and I said, Hey, Templeton, are you going to become the guy that you're supposed to be? You know, that small town kid that had so much promise, everyone believed in you. And I was, uh, at that point, I think I was still selling women's shoes at Nordstrom, which is not a bad thing. It's a great job, but um, I know way more about women's shoes than any straight dude in the world. Um, I've never said the word super cute so much in my life. Oh, those are super cute. We should get two. That's not the point. So, but that's kind of where I was in my life, right? Like I was in this habit loop and at 25, I looked in the mirror and I said, hey, Temp, are you going to become the guy? And that's when I started my first business and I learned about real estate. So I say that to say this, if squirrely me hat wearing curls. I'm covered in $20 tattoos that are not great. I mean, they're good. Tat they're not well done is what I'm saying. That's not the point. Um, but if I'm here and I have eight successful businesses now that, um, to say it plainly, make quite a bit of money. And I just figured out what's my strength. What's my vertical that I could deploy my greatest strengths against and how can I empower people to come with me. So at 25, I say, okay, I'm going to start this first company. I start taking action. So if there's one thing that I really want to impress upon you today is that a perfect plan is worth nothing without action. So what I figured out how to do is just move forward kind of messy and just take action. I failed fast and I failed forward and I either earned or I learned, right? I never failed. I earned or I learned and I never let I read this book, um, I think it's by James Allen's, As a Man Thinketh. It's like 40 pages and it talks about your thoughts. And your thoughts are genuinely the seed that everything is created from. So if you believe you can or you believe you can't, that's the truth. So I had this neighbor at this time who would always beat me in ping pong. Like he was just genuinely a better player than me. And I read this book. Like he was legit better. I could not beat him. I read this book, you guys. I went and knocked on his door aggressive. Like, we're playing ping pong. I read this book. I believed I was going to beat him. You guys, I beat him in ping pong. The next day, I had never shot under 85 in golf. I reread the book, the 40 pages again. I shot an 81. 
I'm telling everyone this book has changed my life. Like literally my thoughts are so powerful. I could probably go to the NBA. This is how I was thinking. So I tell my friends and we go play golf and I shot like a 98. So it's not magic. Like it didn't genuinely change my golf game. But what it did let me know is that I had some limiting beliefs on what was actually possible. So I would encourage you if you're on this journey and you're thinking about business, you're thinking about this idea, everything was created by somebody. This building, this beautiful building that you gave me a tour of earlier and it's just like magical. Someone thought of this. Someone drew it. Someone got the funding to, to raise the capital to build it. And then they, they partnered with someone that had the skill in the construction and the, it all got created from someone's brain. And when you realize that, you start to realize that anything truly is possible. I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up in that small town, I really thought I was just going to, even though it, you know, people say, hey, anything's possible, you can be anything you want. Always in my brain as a kid, I was like, mm, I don't really think so. I think I'm probably gonna get a job. If like at some point I made 100 grand a year, took a couple of vacations, like that would be a really good life. And if someone's happy doing that, great. That is a really good life, right? Like happiness isn't tied to uh, money unless you're unhappy. But that's like a whole rabbit hole we're not going to go down. The point is, I really didn't think anything was possible. But here's what I've learned today. Anything I want to do, I can do. So I have to be very careful on what I decide to put my brain towards and my habits toward and my, my obsession towards and my energy towards because it is possible and you can do it. So if you have that idea to start a t-shirt brand with $500 in a garage or to start a real estate, you know, I have, I, I call it vertically integrated. So I have Templeton Group, I have 20 realtors, I have TLP Ventures that wholesales contracts, I have South Rim Investments that flips homes, I have uh, Silo Title, I have another title company, I have rentals. All of these companies are stacked on top of each other in a vertically integrated way. I'm not like a super bright guy. I know this. I know this thing super well, right? So become masterful at the one thing. What is your one thing that is your value proposition that you can become masterful? And I know people have differing opinions on this, but if you have a weakness, it is my opinion to say, you know what? I'm never going to go be a master coder. I could learn it. I could probably develop that skill a little bit, but I'm never going to be masterful at it. What I can do is go raise capital, um, create a vision for a company, and then I can employ the who, who could code for me, or I can employ the who, who can actually flip the houses. I can employ the who could actually be the realtor. So when you're an entrepreneur, you actually cast this vision and you got to decide, do you want to be the visionary? Like, hey, you're, you're kind of casting the vision and, and leading the charge, or do you want to be the integrator? Maybe you're not great at casting that vision, but you're really good at creating a process and saying, hey, Temp, I love that idea. Let me create a flow chart on it and create some processes around it. Be honest with yourself on who you are. And so for me, I realize I'm like not good at much. I'm really good at like 3%. So guess what I spend all my time on? That 3%. So if you're sitting here today or wherever people are watching and you're saying, gosh, I struggle with these things, what's really exciting is there's people in the world that are amazing at it and they're not good at what you're good at. And if you connect and collaborate together, you can go very far. So when you're thinking about entrepreneurship, anything is possible. Collaboration and teamwork, you're going to go much further together than you ever could alone. Your weaknesses, procrastination are actually a gift. Whenever I have procrastination, I actually, and I didn't, I didn't invent this. I, I read books like viciously. I read like a book a week. Um, whatever book I was reading last week, he was telling me procrastination is actually a gift. Do you want to know why? It's telling you what you're not very good at or that feels heavy to you that you shouldn't be doing. So for me, there's all sorts of administrative tasks in all of my businesses that whenever they're like sitting on the shelf, sitting on the shelf, sitting on the shelf, I know, oh, I need a who for this. I got to like, I got to go hire this out. And that's what I would encourage you to do too is think big. You can scale. You can have a really, you know, uh, you can have a team company when you're in the beginning. Sometimes it can feel like you have to do everything alone. And maybe you do. For a long time when I was just a, a solo realtor when I first started, I had to be my TC, I had to be my showing agent, I had to be the negotiator, I had to put the lockbox on, I had to put the sign in because I didn't have any money, right? So I had to bootstrap a little bit, but I would encourage you to start creating leverage through people and systems as soon as you can. Um, but mindset, 
that's really what we're here for today. I could talk about logistics. I could talk about systems. Um, we're going to hear from someone much better at that than me in just a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to leave that there. What I will say is that this message will only be as powerful as you decide for it to be. This could be the night where you go, you know what? If Goofball Templeton can do it, I can do it. And this message that I'm imparting on you could be the moment where you make a decision and you start taking action, or this idea could be kicking around in your head six months from now, and you're like, gosh, that temp guy kind of inspired me. Like he got me going a little bit, but I never figured out the first step. But remember, and a perfect idea means nothing. I'd rather have imperfect action, motion, right? Like motion creates motion? I just made that up. I don't think that's good, but <laughs> it could be. Uh, how am I doing on time? Anyone? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Keep rolling. Um, so anyway, motion creates potion, and uh, I'm, I'm done here. No, I'm kidding. So another thing, too, you guys, is we have such an amazing community that we can lean on. I can't tell you how many times Mike and I have had two, three, four-hour conversations about the trials in our businesses, and he's pinging ideas off of me, and I'm pinging ideas off of him. Well, that doesn't happen unless you choose to be vulnerable and open yourself up and say, you know what, I need help. So I'll go to Mike and say, Mike, man, I'm dealing with this. I feel like you might have a, a different vantage point that maybe you can give me some perspective and he'll lend me ideas and I go, man, thank you. Well, that doesn't happen unless I can say, you know what, I need help. I, I need help right now. I don't have all the answers and I don't have all the answers, right? So um, you, got to, you got to be willing to ask for help. You can't have it all figured out all the time. The, uh, the belief in yourself is only going to come through habits. And I hate to say this to you, motivation is fleeting, right? Like Jim Rohn said, you can't, you can't go to, uh, what's his analogy? You can't shower once and then be clean the whole month. It's got to be a daily thing. And motivation is the same thing, right? Like you can't go to one weekend seminar. You can't listen to this talk and say, you know what? I'm fired up. Let's go get it. tomorrow. You need to pick up a book that keeps this ball rolling. You need to have a conversation that keeps this ball rolling. You need to keep putting Kindle and, and wood on the flame of your dreams and of your passion because it's not going to happen for you. You have to go get it. You guys, I used to dream about winning the lotto. I didn't even play the lotto. Like I thought the world was going to bring me something. And then at 25, when I looked in the mirror, I said, oh my gosh, like I have to go get it. No one's coming to save me. Like if I want this big life, if I want this dream life, if I want, uh, to be able to help family and friends and create an ecosystem. You guys, I have about 15 homes in one neighborhood that all my family lives in. My mom's retired. My dad works with me. My best friend's here who works with me. My business partners work with me. I can skateboard literally to my office and anywhere important in my life. I manifested that. I had to, I had to be very purposeful in the way I went and did that. So I say all that to say this. Be clear on which way I'm telling you motion is important and yes, take action and, and pivot and, and change direction as needed, but do your best to find some clarity on the front end because you can run a million miles per hour the wrong direction. And sometimes a really good life looks like a lifestyle business. What if you can make four or $5,000 a month, travel nine months out of the year, and you didn't have to go become Mike's bank where everyone, everywhere we go, he's signing autographs and you know, this thing is crazy. Be clear on what you want and understand that comparison is the thief of joy. If I try to go create the biggest real estate company ever, which I tried to do once, I had a hundred grand a month in overhead and I made less money. And guess what? I had a lot more stress, but on the surface, I was like the big realtor guy. And I was like, oh, and then I was on stage talking and you can do it too. And inside I was like, oh my God, this sucks. <laughs> this is not fun. So but that's what I saw the people I was aspiring to be like. I saw them doing it. So I ran that race that they laid. And then I had to get clear on what's Templeton's dream life. What's my mission? What's my purpose? Who do I want to serve? So when I got clear on that, I trimmed my team down to about seven or eight key people. And of course we have subcontractors and a lot more people that are affected, but the key components went from 40 people to eight people. Our profit margins went through the roof and my stress 
compressed. And I deeply changed seven to eight people's lives rather than marginally changing a hundred people's lives. I wasn't making a deep impact. So whatever you're going to do, be clear on your intention and your heart. Um, I will say the success that I have could not have happened if I did not carry myself in a manner that I demand ethics, integrity, you know, and what I do, a lot of times I raise capital, I invest it, we, we grow that capital, and then you owe people money. And you'll find in real estate, a lot of times people want to sway the, sway the capital their way a little bit. And I think I've been able to differentiate myself by saying, no, I can't sleep if not every single penny is accounted for and paid back to my partners. So now there's a line of people that would really love to write me checks because of the way I've carried myself. And um, I think that's just an example of how you do anything is how you do everything. If, if you'll cheat yourself on this one habit or if you'll cheat this business on a free muffin or, you know, that's in your character, it starts to show up in your other ways. So I would challenge you guys to create habits around your morals, your ethics, and let those be core values in your business and your business can flourish on the foundation of those values as opposed to kind of shaky ground. If you're willing to kind of bend the rules a bit, you're going to have a topsy turvy business that will eventually crumble in my opinion. So I had some notes, didn't use any of them. Um, I was kind of on point. If I was going to change your guys' lives right now, I would tell you to control your next five minutes. I don't have it all figured out. I bought two new companies this month, you guys. Two new companies I acquired. I don't exactly know what I'm doing, but guess what? I assessed the risk. I tried to play my best role. I tried to align with the who, the other partners and people who can connect with me well, and I'm taking the chance. I'm moving forward. And five years, one year, one month, one week, two day, all boils down to my next five minutes. What can I do in these next five minutes besides give you guys the best speech you've ever heard? What can I do to change my world, to become a little bit better? How can Templeton six months from now be thankful for the things that I did today? And it starts with my next five minutes. I think that's a Mel Robbins thing. I'm not trying to claim it, but these next five minutes, I'm going to give it my all and take my next actionable step. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's my second elephant in the speech. I don't know. Um, you guys, I appreciate you giving me this platform. If, uh, if I can do this, camera guy's laughing. I got one guy. If I can do this, you can do this. Get clear on your morals, your ethics, your idea, and start going. Start going, take action, believe in yourself, ask for help, stumble, fall, wipe your knees off, wipe your shoulders off, go again. You either earn or you learn. So, thank you for this platform, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, love you guys, peace. Well, you guys got a ton of energy. And our communities really fortunate to have all that energy as he acquires two new companies. I don't get the same calls Mike gets and I feel like I was really tight. I like to think like as a whole, we could do more of this, like my number six, two, three, it's been the same for like 12 years, maybe move it up the favorites list a little bit. Um, we, I, I'm going to work on that. That's how I'm going to control my next five minutes. So let me get some, borrow your phone. We're going to do this ourselves. Um, you know, today's about motivation and mistakes and that's what we take some little motivation. I am like, really jacked up for our next speaker. One, he's a pilot, takes a lot of things to do, gotta have a good mindset, can't have a lot of mistakes. Two, he's also a doctor, takes a great mindset, can't have a lot of mistakes. Lawyers, takes a great mindset, and it's because of our mistakes, they have a job, right? So <laughs> when you think about all three of those things, um, they're really powerful, and I I'm, think we're just incredibly fortunate. Again, so um, before I introduce him, I want to say thank you to the Phoenix Biomedical Campus. I don't know if you did this, Alyssa did this, Mike did this, but it really comes full circle, especially being here downtown. And, you know, we have to drop the sponsor drop. Uh, Soul Pod again, thanks for your donation in Templeton and Sarah last week. But 
you know, the Phoenix Biomedical Campus, they gave me a little written note here, and it starts, Dear Mike, we just want to, just kidding. Uh, t actually, says, Dear Nicholas. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, they're proud to sponsor the State 48 Foundation uh, and providing entrepreneurs the tools they need to build their dream. When you look at what downtown Phoenix has become and, you know, Roosevelt Row right out here, um, the biomedical campus is a big part of that. And they're beneficiaries of this entrepreneur space that continues to grow. You know, the campus represents the nexus of life sciences sector in Arizona. It's home to hundreds of entrepreneurs, researchers, educators, and students coming together to advance population health. And I think through this pandemic in these last few years, we've learned a lot about health. None of us were health at all, but now I feel like we read about health every day and we're learning more and, and creating our own opinions. And I love to know that that research is taking place here downtown because of the biomedical campus. Uh, most importantly, if you want to learn more, it's biomedicalcampus.com. Um, went on there, learned a few things myself, just learning about resources we have in our community. And I think that comes full circle to what we're doing here. But, um, you know, I talked about all these incredible things that our next speaker has done and you, like, mindsets and mistakes. Um, a quote he had on his website, which I loved is, doctors make lousy business people. And you think about that, but like you think they make a lot of money. You, they probably, they definitely do. You always see BMWs in the parking lot. I didn't see yours, but we'll have to talk about that. He's maybe the lawyer side of him. Um, but he wrote a bunch of books. It's 11 books. He started Next Care, Urgent Care. And I'm sure you've seen the, the big sign outside on the, every corner, which was really fascinating as well. And you talk about tribal EM, which I want to learn more about. And as a one-time author, I can't imagine the work it takes to write 11 books, but um, th there's a key word in each of his books, outliers. And I think as entrepreneurs, we really focus on, on the outliers. And I'm really excited to learn what that word means to him. So do I say, <laughs> Dr. John Schelt, do I do the PhD? Do I do the MD? Uh, whatever it is, we're incredibly fortunate to have you. So thank you for joining us. Yes, sir. Thanks, I always say, if it, if you're not dying, I just go by John. So, so John, John works great. So, perfect. So, thanks for inviting me. So, I'll start off, and we'll make this fast, kind of fast. So, I knew when I was five years old, I wanted to be a physician. Now, never mind that I barely passed grade school, and never mind that I barely passed high school. But I always wanted to be a physician. So, fast forward now to when I'm in college, and I was a sophomore in college, and the Pope comes to Des Moines, Iowa, which and I grew up Catholic. Uh, and this was a big deal. 350,000 people showed up and they needed medical people at, when the Pope came because they predicted 50 births and 20 deaths and all this havoc. And I knew nothing about medicine other than I want to be a doctor. But I knew if I went there, they give you this white vest with this red cross like you're in the Crusades. And since I didn't know anything about medicine, they gave me this flag to wave, like a bicycle flag. And all I had to do was walk around. If somebody got injured or hurt, I was supposed to wave the flag. But I also knew that with this white vest, I could go anywhere. So I walked right up to the fence where the Pope was saying mass and then coming down saying peace be with you to everybody. And I was right there. I was from Mary Beth to I away from the Pope. This is really cool. And I'm standing there waiting to shake the Pope's hand. I feel this woman, I feel this tug on my shirt. And this woman's like grabbing my shirt and tugging on my shirt. And I turn around like, what the hell? And she hands me this floppy kid. This kid was like two years old, unresponsive like this. Now, one of the things they make you do before you do this is take CPR. I'm like, oh shit. This kid is dead. So I grab the kid. And I put my hand under him. I did everything we're supposed to. I hold the kid's nose. And I start mouth breathing this kid. And in a real loud voice, she goes, he's asleep, you idiot. Hand him to the Pope. So that was my start of medicine, French kissing a two-year-old. There's a whole Catholic joke in there, but I won't even tell it to you. So, Sorry. So I want to talk about three decades. So this is three decades of entrepreneurs. And I know you're thinking, well, that guy looks like he's only 40 years old and must have started when he was 10. And I did start when I was 10, but I'm not 40. I'm like really old. I'm like, I want to tell you all that, but I'm really old. So this is kind of three decades from when I was about 30 till today. And I want to talk about everything, what, what I've learned. And it's mostly I learned how to fail well. And so Templeton has some great points in there. It's basically you're not either earning or learning. And I did a lot of learning because I wasn't doing a lot of earning for a lot of years. So we're going to talk about three decades of all my failures quickly and a few things that I learned. Fair enough. Here we go. So did you ever see that Steve Jobs talk? So Steve Jobs did this address at Stanford, and he talked about connecting the dots backwards. And it's a Soren Kierkegaard quote. Life can only be understood backwards, but must be lived forwards. So what I got out of this is all these times when I failed, I looked back and said, God, thank God I failed because but for that failure, this wouldn't have happened. And it got to be a pattern because I failed a lot. 
But I was always able to step back and say, God, this makes total sense now. Thank God I failed. And if you listen to that Steve Jobs address it's when he was talking to Stanford, he kind of said the same thing. He goes, you know, you can never have understood my life, nor could he have, trying to connect the dots forward. But looking back, dropping out of college, it all made sense to him and it all kind of fit together. And so I encourage you when you do struggle and stumble and fall, think, you know what, with the right perspective and the right mindset, this too will make quite a bit of sense. So three goals today. First off, if I can do it, anybody can. And uh, and we'll chat about that a little more in a second, but I'm telling you, uh, school is not my thing. I was a poor, mediocre student, poor, poor student, mediocre on my best days. Uh, I got into one college, thank God. So if I can do it, anybody can. Number two, I want to impart a little bit of information I wish I'd known because it would have saved me a lot of time, a lot less sleepless nights. I wouldn't have talked to the ceiling fan at 3 a.m. And then encourage you to be the person in the arena. And we'll get to that in a second. So three maxims. Always have a backup plan. So this kind of is, so I, I, I fly a lot. One of the things I fly are helicopters. And if you're flying a single engine helicopter, the whole time you're flying, you need to be looking for a place to land. Because if you have an engine failure, you have to auto-rotate. You've got only a few seconds to find that spot, point the helicopter to it, drop the collective, and head towards that point to land. And it is a one-shot deal. Also in the emergency department, when people are dying, things are going bad, you often have one chance. So if you don't have a, if you don't think of this backup plan sort of mentality, it can come back to bite you. If it was easy, anybody could do it. So this is the rejoice in the struggles sort of quote. This is where you say to yourself, you want it to be hard. You want to struggle. You want it to cost a lot of money because if it doesn't, that means somebody else could do it and sneak right up on you and take it away from you. And finally, if no one is dying, how bad can it be? This goes back to my emergency medicine. And, and frankly, I take this as kind of a fault because I look at most things in life this way. If no one is dying, how bad can it be? Every I work at St. Joe's mostly. I walk out of there and I always think, my worst day is 100 times better than most of these people's best day. So if no one's dying, I mean, it's all good because no one's dying. All right, three poems. So the poem called Invictus is you've probably heard of Nelson Mandela. So Nelson Mandela was in, in jail for 27 years in South Africa uh, during apartheid. And he talked about this poem that he would recite to himself and to others all the time. But I want to give you, and this is a classic entrepreneur's poem. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. In the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I'm the master of my fate and I'm the captain of my soul. And as an entrepreneur, at the end of the day, you are the captain of your soul because at the, at the end of the, most days, it all comes down to you. It all comes down to what your actions are. It all comes down to what your perspective is and how much you can tolerate. Which takes me to this poem, uh, If, by Rudyard Kipling, and here's kind of the relevant part of it. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone and hold on when there's nothing left in you except the will which says to then hold on. There are times when you're doing this is you'll think, you know, I've got nothing left. This tank is empty. And I've learned over the years, when I say that, I'm probably at 40%. I always have more left in the tank. And you look at some people who do these phenomenal things and they're just crushing. They say, how do they do that? Because they're so far beyond what I could ever imagine. They too have said at one point, you know what, I'm at the end of my road and yet they always dig down and find more. So I take a lot of sol solace in their ability to do that and find the man in the arena. And I'm gonna actually read this one to you because this is the ultimate entrepreneur's poem. So he wrote this, or he said this in the Sorbonne in 1917. He was kind of railing against these critics uh, that were there. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man in the arena who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcomings, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. 
and as Templeton talked about, this is the this is the get off your ass part of it. This is, you know what, be the man in the arena, be the person in the arena. And it doesn't matter if you fail. It doesn't matter if you succeed, because at the end of the day, you will know that you gave it your best shot. So here's a little about my um, about my story. So I, I, I embarrassingly enough, had a few more businesses in this, which I won't tell you about, like the uh, dead TV and some other ones. But these are my three outcomes, sold, folded, and grew. And so I've had a lot of experience with a lot of businesses. And you look up there and think, wow, that guy's done a lot. And actually, it, it looks a lot more impressive than it is. It wasn't really all that impressive because most of it was shrouded in failure. And there were a few things that seemed to work well. But like I said, I'll talk to you about the things I learned. Now, there is one little caveat. So some people see these multiple degrees and think that guy's really smart. Well, let me tell you the exact opposite is true. I had to get a lot of education because I was not all that smart. So that's why I went back to school a lot. And I got to kind of love learning. But you probably don't believe me, so I'm going to prove it to you. I like to be highly organized. And so I find I try to be really efficient because time's the most valuable commodity you have. So I try to be on top of things. Well, one day I wasn't. I came back from this trip and I realized I was working in the emergency department the next day, but I also realized I had jury duty. And I couldn't go to jury duty because I can't miss a shift in the ED, but it was five minutes to five. And I knew that by five o'clock that the die was cast. So I had to get online quickly and write in this excuse why I couldn't uh, be on jury duty the next day to get it postponed. So I go through this whole thing. I'm about to submit. I go, you know, actually, there was, a, there was a line there that said, are you in law enforcement? I've been the Phoenix SWAT director, uh, Phoenix SWAT team medical director for years and years. So I wrote, well, I guess I'm kind of in law enforcement. So I go back and I change that. I finally hit submit one minute to five. And this pops up. <laughs> and I look and I go, what, what the hell? How do they know? And so there's a number to call, and I call this number, and I said, hey, I tell her the story, and, and, and she goes, uh -huh. and I go, but I, I, I don't think I'm incompetent. I mean, I'm not that bright, but I'm not incompetent or insane. And she goes, no, no, it's okay. You don't have anything to worry about. It will all work out. And she's talking to me like I was four years old, and I, every time I, but no, I'm really not incompetent or insane. And she's like, no, no. So I finally was getting nowhere with her, so I hung up. To this day, I've never been called for jury duty. So I don't know what I did, but if you don't want to go to jury duty, I advise you to do it. All right, 10 positives, I won't read them. These are kind of all, all the gains I've got out of all this. And the most important was I've mentored, a, I've mentored a lot of future game changers and I get more happiness and more joy out of, out of working with folks and mentoring them and letting them know of all the mistakes I made and that if I can do it, they can do it. Uh, all these other things have been great. I've had a lot of fun, haven't met a day in my life, met some totally rock star people, but mentoring these future game changers has been the, the, really the highlight of my life. 10 things I've learned that we'll go through. Okay, first off is ideas are easy. How many people here, here will say, oh my God, I've got this great idea, and then they do nothing. And like Templeton just talked about, you know what, step into the ring and, and, and go for it. So there's a couple ways to look at this. One is read Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One. Zero to One, as you say, an idea that no one started before, and then you take it through fruition. And that's this, the Peter Thiel approach. And he talks about a couple of different companies that are zero to one. I've probably had a couple of zero to ones in my, in my life that have worked, and some of them didn't work. Uh, and then one to end. One is basically you're improving on someone else's idea. And the theory is that yours idea needs to be at least 10 times, and your execution needs to be at least 10 times better for people to really change. Find problems, find solutions for problems that are expensive and urgent and frequent. You want them to be recurring. You want them to be expensive so we can solve more. It's a barrier to entry. And find solutions to solve problems, not the opposite. People pitch me deals all the time, and sometimes these things are really cool. But I'm like, that's a really cool idea, but what's the problem it's trying to solve? And I thought, well, we'll think of a problem, but this like, there's a blockchain thing I looked at. This is really cool, but what does it work on? So, well, I, I'm not sure yet, but I think I'll find out some solution, or I think I'll find some problem to apply a solution, which is all great, but you want to do the opposite. Startups are hard. And this is the one thing that, you know, I've delivered about 300 kids. I've never had a child. And I think startups are like having a baby because, you know, I deliver these kids and these women are like, I'm never doing that again. Probably because it's me delivering them. I'm never doing that again. And then like eight months later, like, you know, I think about having another child. What? Remember, like you were screaming and yelling and cursing at your, you know, significant other? Yeah, that wasn't so bad. Like, it's like a startup. I've had a lot of startups and they're like, oh, geez, this is 
freaking hard. But again, you want you want to make it hard. You want to rejoice in how difficult it is because if it wasn't, other people would do it. They would have done it before you. Ex expect success, hope for success, but definitely plan for failure. Have your backup plan. And the faster you go, the quicker you get to this persevere or pivot. You get to the point where you say, you know what, this is working, persevere. Or if it's not working so well, okay, make a little pivot and do whatever it takes to make it to get to the point where it's moving quickly. One of the things I've often forgotten to do is eat healthy, exercise, and sleep. I've probably spent 20 years sleep deprived. I fell asleep at stoplights. I fell asleep flying a helicopter. And I fell asleep flying a plane to where point I had to buzz a town to read the name off the water tank to figure out where the hell I was. Prep your family and friends because, again, people, unless you've done it, don't have a real sense of how hard it is. But if you can prep them and say, look, there'll be times when I'm sleep deprived. There'll be times when I'm probably short. There'll be times when I should pay more attention to you and don't. Give them at least a heads up of what's coming. And always plan for the exit. Again, in the rush of starting things, a lot of times, and I did this often, is I wouldn't save all the documents, or I wouldn't do, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the blocking and tackling because I want to get, I want to get to the start so quickly. So build the data room as you go. Be diligent about your cap table. Be diligent about giving out options. You can always give more, but once you give them, you can't take them away. And really spend a lot of time with your attorney on the operating agreement because the operating agreement tends out to be now you can change it. But it's basically your Bible for a while, and you live, eat, and breathe by via the operating agreement. Prepare for the worst. Now, you guys heard the term hanger flying? So hanger flying is where you sit around and you say, all right, what could happen if? This is, this is the have a backup plan. So I'll tell you a quick story. So I have this cabin up north. It's right on an airstrip. Friend, and I was up there with a friend, Glenn, who's a pilot. He was the CFO of MeMD, this virtual medicine business. And this other friend of ours flies up to pick us up in his plane. Here's the plane. It's a 1945 Cessna 190, beautiful plane. We're sitting around hangar flying the night before, drinking a glass of wine. Rick says, you know, this plane's awesome. He goes, the problem is if it crashes, you usually survive, but you're burned to death. Good to know. So why? He said, well, it only has one door. And if it hits the fuselage, hits something, it bends and it locks the door basically. And people are trapped inside. The fuel's up on top of the wings there. So, all right, good to know. So we hang or flew a little bit, had some more wine, get up the next morning, pack up the plane, and Glenn and I are going back and forth. I'm like, Glenn, you sit in the front seat. He's like, no, John, you sit in the front seat. So he gets them back, I get in front, and I fill up the back with all this crap we're bringing back from the, from the cabin. Rick takes off, loses control, basically on takeoff. We get about 10 feet in the air and crash into the side of a building. That's the plane. Now, it wasn't the plane right away. Rick breaks his back, Glenn jumps out and runs down the taxiway. I said, yeah, Glenn, thanks for, you know, leave no man behind, thanks for that. And um, Rick just kind of screaming, and the inside of the plane is disheveled, and I'm pulling Rick out over the seats to a point where my fingerprints are in his upper arms. I lay him down on the grass, and what do I do? Stupidly, I go back into the plane to try to get my computer out. And so the flames are getting bigger, and they're kind of up more front towards the engine, and fuel's dripping down from the wing. So as I'm in the plane, and it's getting a little warmer. I see this guy walk around the side of the hangar. It's like 7 a.m. on Cinco de Mayo. He's like, oh, my God, oh, my God. I, I got out of the plane. I said, it's all right. I called 911, which is a whole travesty if you have a Phoenix cell phone and you're not in Phoenix, by the way. And I said, just get a fire extinguisher because the grass was on fire. And I'd already poured out my Diet Mountain Dew. I was really start peeing on the grass because the grass was on fire. He's like, okay. So he runs back around the hangar. I go back, stupidly, get inside the plane. And I'm pulling more stuff out, and I see the guy out of the corner of my eye come around the hangar again and fall flat on his face like the hand of God threw him on the ground. I'm like, oh, shit, he's had a heart attack. So I get out of the plane. I run over to him. I bend down. The whole plane explodes from the inside. Fire department comes. The guy's fine. He trips, doesn't have a heart attack. He breaks his nose. He was the worst injured person in the whole, in the whole deal, other than Rick, who was an insurer because he broke his back. And uh, we're walking down. The plane gets put out, and we're walking down the runway afterwards, and I go, Rick, you know, the plane blew up from the inside. Like, how did that happen? He goes, oh, Johnny, I probably, should have, I probably should have told you there was a full oxygen bottle inside the tank behind the pilot seat, which literally blew up and blew the plane apart, blew the wings off. I was in there probably 15 seconds before the thing went off because when I bent down to take a look at the guy, the whole plane exploded. And I said, and what was that popping sound? And he said, oh, yeah, he goes, I probably should have told you. Because I, I thought if I ever crashed, wouldn't it be good to have a shotgun and some shotgun shells there to defend myself? So I said, Rick, wouldn't it be funny if we survived the plane crash and the plane shot us in the ass as we ran down the runway? 
So I'm telling you a story because I want you to remember this. The only reason we're all alive is because one, we hang your food the night before. Two, Glenn kicked the door open before we hit the hangar. I don't think I would have been cognizant enough to do it. It was just like a slow motion Disney ride that Glenn saved us. And then that guy tripping uh, saved me from getting blown up and not getting blown up inside the plane. So if you prepare for the worst, nothing is a surprise because you've already hangar flew. You've already expected that. And it really, if you plan for failure, and it really prevents failure. Well, I used to do this thing at Nextcare. So Nextcare grew to about $100 million. We had 1,000 employees. And we did this thing every month called How Do I Beat Nextcare? And we would sit around and brainstorm ways that if we're a newbie coming to the market, what would we do to beat us? And we took a lot away from that because we started a lot of programs and projects that, but for thinking, what would somebody do to beat us? Uh, we never would have done it. So don't retain poor performers. This, is, uh, this has always been a challenge for me. So I read this book a number of years ago by Jack Welch. You know Jack Welch is GE. And if you read a book about Jack Welch, Jack Welch is pretty cool, but it's probably a little more show than go. There's a book recently called Lights Out about the failure of GE. But one thing Jack Welch said in this book is about they would cut the bottom 10% of their workforce every year. They'd rate everybody and whack them. I thought, well, that was brutal. That's, that's not me. But one thing he said in there really stuck to me, he goes, if you don't do that, if you, if you don't hold people accountable and manage them by the metrics and, 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 and basically offload people that aren't performing, at some point, someone will. And it may be at that point when now all of a sudden they're my age and they're unemployable because people have just shined them on all these years. And it's really an unkind thing to do. And it really made sense to me. So now I've gotten good at having these discussions, not that I like it, but like, here's where you are, here's where you need to be. I will happily help you get here. And here's the time frame you need to do it in. And I'm on your, I'm, I'm, as, I'm on your side of the table, I'm happy. But at the end of the day, you've got to get here. And if you don't, that's okay. Then we're going to find a way to part ways and it will be kind and it will be respectful and I'll help continue to help you. But, but I can't have you weighing down the rest of the team if you're not going to put in the effort if you can't perform. So I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Um, I found this thing and I love it. So bottoms values, horizontals value, the, the vertical one is basically ability what your work product looks like. So if you have high values, high work product, love the hell out of them. These are your high performers, promote them, give them bonuses, give them raises. They're awesome. People are now in this quarter, non-performing, bad attitude, they were a bad hire. You got duped. And I've gotten duped before. I like everybody. I mean, if I don't like you during an interview, you're, little, you're, you're, you know, you're basically like a serial killer because I, I like everybody. And I've hired a few serial killers. So if they're here, get rid of them right away. The, here are the tricky ones. The people with great, they're high performers. These are like, I used to have a, um, business coaching surgeons who had bad attitudes. And they were tough because the hospitals would say, hey, John, this guy, and it was all, all, this will shock none of the women here. There was always men. This guy is a super high performer. He's got a shitty attitude, but he brings in a lot of money to the hospital. Can you fix them? And they're pretty much always narcissists. And what I learned over the years is you can't fix them. You can't fix values. I think Templeton said this really well. If you don't have the ethics or the morals or the values, me chatting about, me chatting about that with you is not going to fix you. Give them a shot. Say, look, great. You're doing a great job, but your values don't fit with our core culture. And if you cannot change that, you can, don't have a place to work. You give them a very short window and very clear goals. These are much easier people. They're not quite performing, but man, you love having them around because they just reek culture. They are just all about whatever, whatever your vision is, whatever the business uh, is trying to achieve. And these people, you just coach the heck out of them. Some of them get up here. Some of them don't. It's all good. Like I said, here's where you have to go. Happy to get you up here. Um, and if you do great, I'll be your biggest cheerleader. So I've learned this the hard way. You've heard the Peter Thiel, or, or you've heard the Drucker culture eat strategy for breakfast. Culture is everything. You could have the best strategy in the world, but if you don't have people on your team who support the vision, what you're trying to do, it will go nowhere. I think you can train motivated people to do anything. Uh, but you can't fix values. And I could tell you stories about the one bad apple, but just with one company I had, thousands of employees, there was a guy that got hired 
and I wasn't, I, I'm always the last interview and I, I do behavioral interviews. What do you do to improve yourself? What's the last book you read? The guy failed it miserably. He hadn't read a book since college. The guy was in his forties. And I went back to the committee. I said, you know, it's not a guy that I'd hire. I don't think Getty fits our culture, our values, because for me, I hire for culture. And they said, well, he's really good at this. I'm like, okay, I'm not a micromanager, but I would not hire him. They hired him and he was the one bad apple. He literally caused, he just wreaked damage for a few years before they finally got rid of him. I made this mistake before, choose investors and board members wisely. Everybody's money is green, but when you're starting out, you think, oh my God, this guy's gonna invest in me. This is awesome, or this woman's gonna give me some money. It's awesome. But at the end of the day, you have to live with those board members. And if those board members have bad ethics, if they're bad apples or bad actors, that can negatively impact your business. And I've had this again, I've had this challenge a couple of times. They could try to gain board control or like Steve Jobs, they do gain board control, kick you out of the company you started. So even if someone's waving money at you, really do your diligence about them. Make sure that they fit your culture and values as well. Make sure you can have healthy disagreements with them um, because they can be literally like a cancer for your business. Um, value, diversity, and partners. I look for diverse backgrounds, skill sets, genders, everything I can because what people that are not like me bring is different thought process. They have a different pair of glasses than I do. They, they can see things that I can't see. And I've gained so much wisdom and knowledge and respect for people who think differently than I do. Um, if the, the old Henry Ford thing, if two people are thinking alike, you don't need one of them. Back in the next care days, I used to write an email to our thousand employees pretty much every day. And they were always positive. It was always laudatory. And I got in trouble by those emails because I would say in there, hey, you know, Clinic X, um, you're only testing 3% of the patients and you should be testing five, even though we see 20% of the patients with the disease process, blah, blah, blah. So people came back and said, look, you're encouraging improper testing because you're promising people that if, if they get up to their, their metric, you'll, you'll get them pizza on Friday. So be super cautious with what you're putting down in email because, because although I, my intent was good, if you look at that email just in its one little box, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna give you pizza if you test more people doesn't look very good. And my mindset, look, if someone comes in as my age with chest pain, you better be doing 100%. You better be doing EKGs on 100% of them. Make total sense, right? That's a standard of care. But if I say to you, and if you do, I'm going to get you pizza on Friday, that looks like you're encouraging uh, testing. So I'm a lifelong learner. I try to go back to school every five to 10 years. And every time I do, it's like putting on a new pair of glasses. And every time I'm like, how the hell have I missed this? Because it's staring me right in the face. So I've had a lot of business ideas and opportunities only because I put on this new pair of glasses through education and said, Jesus, staring me right in the face. How could I have missed that? Uh, for me, it prevented burnout. You know, burnout's a big thing in emergency medicine. I've really never really not wanted to practice medicine. I love it. But I think I do. One of the reasons is because one, I was probably born to do it because it's probably the only thing I could do. And number two is I have this diversity of interests. So it allows me to be creative over here and practice medicine here and law over here. But I always like, I can't wait to get back in the emergency department because that's really where my heart is. Uh, I think in this day and age to keep up, it's just necessary to stay current. You know, without education, without, without keeping yourself, it doesn't have to be formal education. Tumble mentioned he reads a book a week. That's about my average as well. That's education. You're learning something, you're trying to stay abreast. And I think it's vital for your own longevity. You've heard people say, oh my God, it's a young person's game. I think the people that say that just haven't kept up. So I tell myself this a lot, and I love this quote. One day in retrospect, the years of struggle will strike you as the most beautiful. And I, I can't emphasize this enough. Some of these times I'm like, oh God, damn, this is really, this is hard. And I think of this quote, and it's so true. You know, I look back at the times I'm driving through the reservation at three in the morning and almost hit a moose or, you know, I have triple mortgaged the house or I've sold a helicopter to make payroll. I look back and those were always kind of the fun times. Because other times we all, we all bound together, we all solved the problems and, and we all did it. So again, when you're struggling and when it's like, you know what, I, one more thing will freaking kill me. Think of the Sigmund Freud quote and it. I will tell you being old like I am, it's so true. So a long time ago, I was a resident and it was, uh, I was probably 27. I was a second year resident. This guy comes and he's dying. He's probably seven years old and he knows he's dying. He's DNR, I think he had cancer and he was not gonna live the rest. He was not gonna live an hour, but he was awake. 
And, you know, I talked to him and examined him and was just trying to comfort him. And he had this look on his face and this, I, I, it was this look of infinite sadness. And it was this look of, I could tell you, in his mind, going through all the things he wished he would have done and didn't, all the conversations he didn't have, all the trips he didn't take. And I called it the if only look. And I thought, I will be damned if I'm going to be in my deathbed with that look on my face. And then a few years later, I found this quote by Hunter Thompson. Life's journey is not to rise safe in the grave in a well-preserved body, but to rather to skid inside always totally worn out yelling, holy shit, what a ride. And that's what I think this guy realized on his deathbed. And unfortunately for him, it was too late. And so I would encourage you sitting here who are all way younger than me to have this perspective of you do not want to have this if only look on your deathbed because it will be a life wasted. Now, I'm a, I'm a reincarnation sort of believer, so I think I'll probably go around a few more times to, before I get it right. Um, but I don't want to have that look on my face. So this is a quote by Mark Twain. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do, by those you did. So throw off the bow line, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. Take Templeton's advice seriously. That This is your time. It's, it's, you have the total ability to change the world, and now is your time to do it. The fact that you're here means you want to do it. So get off your ass and do it. Thanks. <laughs> Seven o'clock. All right. Well, I know what my scratch sheet of paper looks like. How about everybody else? <laughs> I, this has been, of all the things we get to do with State 48, getting to be a part of this uh, speaker series has been incredible. Uh, I've said before, like, I wrote a book. I thought I was a business owner. I'm not a business owner. I just put a book on Amazon. But I've got to meet some incredible people in this room that are starting businesses, are running businesses. But um, tonight, Temp and John, uh, not because it's the last, but you guys just crushed it and, and we're so incredibly great for you. Um, just grateful in general. But um, before we get into some Q&A, uh, a couple things I, I was gonna start off with, uh, you know, everyone in the room, before we go, for those that are here now, it started all virtual and then we kind of invited a few folks, but raise your hand if you already have your own business, okay? Uh, raise your hand in here if you're thinking about starting your business or you plan to after all of this. Oh, just me, okay. I'm just kidding. That <laughs> okay. A couple other people, but and for everybody at home, you know, the best part about this is like we're not going anywhere. And I know I said that last week, and I said it in week one, but we're not going anywhere, and neither are our guests. So while this Q and A is great, I've got uh, a lunch on on Monday with Joey. Uh, maybe I'll go to the gym tomorrow with Mike. I'm still working on that part of my schedule. But um, as we wait for some questions online, you know, I kind of want to start. Got a microphone over there, but um, you know, you both of you talked about uh, taking that first risk. Um, let's start with like, tell me about when you're working at a job, like most people that are haven't done yet, where you're like, you know what? this just isn't for me, like I'm destined to be an entrepreneur and you did take that risk. So what was that first moment at the job and then what was that first business? Yeah. So for me, I think I, I remember once like very clearly I was working at the grocery store at the Grand Canyon that my dad ran and um, Grand Canyon, baby. And uh, I remember playing these games with like within my own head to make the clock move. And I was like, I'm gonna go do these five tasks and get them done. and three hours should be off the clock. And I went and did these things and literally like 27 minutes had gone by. And I was like, I can't have a job. This is so hard. Um, so that was the moment for me where I realized, okay, I'm making $6 an hour at this job at the Grand Canyon as a 16 year old. So what I did is I started a lemonade stand on highway 64 where all the tourists come in. I had no shirt on. I was getting a tan. I was making like $50 an hour. And then the park rangers shut me down and they're like, you can't do this. But um, that was my first moment where I started to see as a 16 year old, I was like, wow, I just made in an hour $50, what was gonna take me an entire day. And like John spoke about, time is our most precious commodity. And when you stop trading linear, you know, my hour for this time, and you start trading exponential, you create companies or systems that can grow, you know, they can make you thousands of dollars per hour uh, through systems, processes, and people. That was, I think I understood that at that first lemonade stand. Can't stand seeing things that I think should be different in art. So I'll see a problem or I'll, what I'll perceive as a problem and say, you know, this seems like an easy fix. Why hasn't somebody fixed this before? And then I'll have my aha moment. I'll think, well, God, I guess I can fix this or try to. And sometimes it's worked, sometimes it hasn't. But it was just this inability to not 
to not let go of us, not let go of a problem until I found a solution for it. And some, a lot of times the solutions were totally stupid and off the wall, but sometimes like I said, they worked. Hmm. Thank you guys. Well, we're sort of in the room, start asking about your questions. We'll kind of pass the mic around again if you've got a question here. And uh, for those watching online as well, uh, Nick is monitoring in the back and, and please submit your questions there. We'll ask that. But um, something that kind of strikes me from both of you and um, from those in the room we've heard from, they have one business because they say, hey, I'm a carpenter, so I'm going to start a wood business. And maybe they're just going to do woodwork. But I heard from both of you today, you dabble in multiple businesses, which does take incredible risk, but you're, you're both readers and you're learning about everything and you're both problem solvers. Let's talk a little bit about owning two separate businesses that don't even complement each other and yet being the CEO of both, which, which shows leadership, but also a lot of risk on both sides. So can you talk about owning two different businesses that maybe you're not the most competent in, but you're going to lead? Well, for me, again, um, finding, finding my who. So I really don't start businesses unless I have the correct who, like a partner who can be the integrator, because I know my skill set. Remember, I'm kind of a visionary. I like to cast an idea. I like to the funnel and bring capital in, but I'm not very good at actually executing the, the day to day game plan. It's not in my skill set. So the business, I hear me. Okay. I don't know why it's doing that, but, um, for me, I don't feel a lot of risk Zach, just because, um, I don't get over my skis. I don't take risk that I feel is inappropriate that could crumble the whole castle. And then I really try to place, um, bets on on partnerships where we're each in the correct seats on the bus and rowing the right direction and you don't row in a bus but you get what i'm saying i'm processing that one <laughs> uh, whatever row the bus uh, i'd like to just hedge my bets so i try to find complementary businesses and ones that i can play off each other um because if one doesn't work, I'll have three more that may work. And for me, it was just uh, basically a hedge. All right. Well, thank you guys both. We got our first question online from Joshua. And uh, his question here was, you know, what was your mission from the outset? Self-improvement or self-benefit? Improvement. I, uh, we talk about service and, and helping others. And I'm a firm believer that you can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to become the best version of yourself before you can then really help others. So self-improvement, become your best version, and then you can become the best real estate or, or doctor or attorney or whatever you're going to be. So self-improvement is definitely number one mm. for me. So this question comes from Yasmin. So half of me wants to know if, if my wife logged in and she's using an alias because she asked this question a lot and I'm not an entrepreneur yet. So if this is Meryl, if you're watching, I, this is a great question. Yasmin, this is an awesome question. <laughs> um, man, I feel seen right now. I've definitely seen, but I could tell as people in this room, we're all getting get busy again coming out of the pandemic. And we're trying to do a little bit more after a year of probably not doing enough, which will be another question we have. But let's get to Yasmin's question. What would be some tips for spouses or partners to understand difficulties of the entrepreneurial life? And what would that bring into their relationship? I'll let you answer that one. I haven't figured that answer. <laughs> um, so for me, I think it's in all relationships, especially in marriage. And if my beautiful wife, Denise is watching, I love you. Um, but setting proper expectation, right? Like I remember in the beginning when I was first building my business, um, I remember like secretly paying Zillow at the time. Cause I was like a regular realtor, like $10,000 a month for leads that I did not have. And, um, then I went in the other room and I told my wife, Hey, I spent way too much money. And if this phone rings and says Zillow, like if we're on our anniversary dinner, like I have to answer it. Um, and if I would have not expressed that to her and let her know how much risk I was taking and how important this was, taking that phone call would have went really bad. But instead, I told her what I was up to and why. And when that phone rang, she was like the biggest cheerleader. She's like, close that lead, baby. You got it. Like we need this money. And that's how we got started. So expectation is huge. I love that. John, anything? I don't have a great answer other than I found less is more. And so like, you know, she had to buy off in the third, third mortgage on the house. And she wondered why the helicopter was missing from the hangar one day, but I'd always tell her, but telling her prospectively just seemed to worry her. And I thought, you know what, if I'm worrying and she's worrying, that's one person who's wasted worries. So 
I beg for forgiveness a lot. <laughs> I appreciate that. Me too. <laughs> so I think that's very relatable Hashtag. in the room. Um, you know, I, again, I, I want to make sure we talk about that relatability is just because you're successful. Um, there is that sacrifice. And we've talked about even if you're not successful, maybe you're not crushing those <laughs> realtor.com leads or whatever the Zillow leads like that sucks, but you're still moving. I heard it from both of you. Your failures are moving you forward. And I loved your quote about um, life is forward, but you have to reflect backward and of some nature of that. But it is one of those things that I think we have to continue to build these communities. And I want to continue to stress the State 48 Foundation. Everyone that's spoken on this lead, the speaker series is this is another community that you are now a part of. And what we've heard from both of you today, all of our speakers over the last six weeks is that by choosing to speak up, my man is back here again. He had the question last week. He does um, welding and turns trailers into some really cool things. And, and yet you showed up again and you made that impression on me. I don't know if you've accepted my offer of investment. I don't think he should because I'm not the right investor for him, which is what all, I, money, is all money is green though. <laughs> but that's, let's go. And I promise you like Denise, I'll cheerlead you and I'm hype for you all the time. <laughs> But that's what I want to continue to say is I know we're becoming busier again coming out of the pandemic. We're asking questions like, what do I want to do? Do I want to make $6 an hour, 12 or these kids these days, $13 an hour? That's minimum wage. I was at great skate at 515. It's crazy. But building these communities of entrepreneurs, you're leaving a job knowing what you make. And I loved your, your linear equation. And I, I want to continue to stress that. So um, coming out of this pandemic, which is the root of this, this whole discussion is, I think there are a lot of people now saying, oh my gosh, like, did I better myself enough? I had two years. What do I do? What did you guys do through the pandemic to survive, to thrive, to prepare for this moment? Talk about what the pandemic was like for your businesses and what you did to continue to sharpen yourself and your teams. So for me, I felt like the pandemic, um, what you got, Nick? Okay, Zach, he, he needs you. Uh, for me, I felt like the pandemic, it really put a magnifying glass on your habits and you could lean into good ones or bad ones, right? Like that glass of wine was easier every night or it went away. And so for me, I just decided to like get fit and, uh, you know, spend so much time with my kids and, and really just pour into the good habits because I'm the type, like I like to go out and maybe have some cocktails if there's something to do, but there was nothing to do. So I didn't drink for a year. Wow. I got fit. Like I was like, I didn't look pregnant. I was like, this is cool. There was only one pregnant looking lady in my house, my wife, she'd been pregnant two years in a row. I'm sorry, babe, I love you. But um, to speak to about the businesses, I also was patient. So for two weeks when the pandemic hit, I buy homes, like I buy a lot of houses, I, buy, I try to buy a house every day, and then I either sell the contract or I take down the home and I flip the house or I turn it into a rental. That's what I do. So for two weeks, I did not buy houses because I was so, I, I kind of needed to figure out, hey, what's this market gonna do? And I'm so ADHD, I started a flannel company, Canyon Boy. And you guys, I think I lost like $5,000 doing that. And I have a closet full of flannels if anyone wants any. So stay in your lane, be patient. But you guys know what I did do? It kept me, it kept me motivated for a couple of weeks. I got some creative wiggles out. I, you know, I designed it. A few of my friends have those now. But I was patient and two weeks later, I got back on track. I started buying houses. I felt good about the market and I ran my playbook and I didn't try to be something I was not. Well, actually I did. I started Canyon Boy and that was just, uh, it was fun, but it was not. Stay in your lane, be patient and run the plays you know. Like I'm not gonna go be a doctor. I know how to buy houses well. Although that flannel sounds actually interesting. In, in Arizona. So for, you know, for my line of business, the, the pandemic was a little interesting. So, you know, people were literally dying in droves in emergency departments. I had friends who were sick and EM docs were getting sick from COVID before the vaccine came out. So it was our, the emergency medicine company I have was very challenging. Our volume dropped a lot and the people that were there were sick as hell. And there's still a lot of sick as hell people out there who aren't vaccinated, hint. Um, but for the virtual medicine business that I had, you know, when starting in 2010, people were like, what's virtual medicine to like, oh, that's kind of cool to like, ah, oh, I've heard of that. So all of a sudden in 2019, it was a must have. And so as odd as it sounds, you know, the pandemic for me, MD, the business we just sold to Walmart, it just went like this. 
And so it probably put me and D three, three years ahead on, tr uh, on the track that we were on because of the pandemic. So we played a lot of catch up. And then when, once Walmart got interested, we, you know, had a six month sprint to, to go through their due diligence. And if you ever wonder what due diligence is like with the largest company in the world, it is exactly as you would imagine it when there you have the 9,000 pound gorilla and you're the little ant that they're about to step on. So they were nothing but professional and, and, and kind and smart as hell, but it was Walmart. Mm -hmm. Like I said, well, how fortunate are we to have him as a guest today? Templeton, you got to get together, brother. You got to get it together. <laughs> Just kidding. After this presentation and the slides, I was like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but we got, hey, we have like 15 and a half years of college up here, and I got half of the year. I got <laughs> half, of half, half of it. Well, we appreciate it. Yeah. No, no. I, that's the fun part about entrepreneurship is that that's that. And, um, we, that's a whole nother wheelhouse there, but we're going to do some rapid fire questions here that we had five come in online pretty quick. Uh, one book you read recently and think it was that as a man thinketh. Okay. Better. Uh, the most recent one is essentialism. Okay. All right. Um, back and forth. All right. So, uh, mental health tip. What's one mental health tip you have for entrepreneurs and people at home? I get in a cold plunge and sauna every day and do breathing and do weird stuff in my backyard. And I would encourage you to make those health habits a priority. You copycat. I get in a cold plunge and sauna every day. Uh, you're, you're, I'm only 51 degrees. You're a badass. But what, but, but, but more important sleep. So I ignored sleep for a long time. There's a book called why we sleep. It was eye opening for me, pun intended. Um, but boy, if you're not, I used to think, you know, you only sleep when you're dead, all those lines. It's all bullshit. You need sleep. What do you do with a three week daughter in the sleep? Cause I'm trying to figure that out right now. You're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, cold plunge. I, I new to me. I've seen the videos of the cold plunge. I think that's something we'll have to look into. Mike, we're going to have to raise some money. State 48. We'll get a little cold plunge. I kind of like the idea. Um, all right. Next one. Um, working with family and friends. I don't, John, if, if you want to share that, have you ever worked with family and friends? What are tips that you have do's and don'ts? Don't. <laughs> so he just sold a company to Walmart. So listen to him, but I employ like all my family and friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, Sam, we're going to have to get these heart to hearts together. Move me up the favorites list. No, but that's the cool part about entrepreneurship. And, and I, I kind of want to stay on this topic though, because I know there are a few people in here that, that are going to do business with family. And while it is tricky, that's why he's a lawyer as well. So <laughs> one worst case scenario. And actually, the people that I end up employing, I'm friends with for life, generally, always, actually. And so I end up employing family and friends because they become family and friends. But I've had some really weird experiences with people who are family first, and then you try to help them out, and it doesn't work. Makes Thanksgivings awfully odd. These are some great questions. So, uh, Matt, I hope you got those good book recommendations. Please share that with everyone else here. Um, Templeton working with family. That was great. All right. Darina, uh, she was the one that kind of asked about mental health. And I want to kind of come back to that because as employees, I think far too often we're all saying, I have to achieve. I have to go. I have to be there. I can only be on lunch for one hour. I can only go at lunch when my colleague is not back from lunch or is at lunch. Talk about how you empower your employees from an empowerment perspective of having a little bit of freedom after being able to work from home in gym shorts and a tank top. Absolutely. And John spoke about it in his speech is culture is everything. What's the line? Culture eats. Strategy for breakfast. So I think I, I fast. I fast till noon. Do you fast? I do. Look at us. I'm a mini John. I'm going to sell something to Walmart. I'm going to sell something to Walmart in like 10 years. Anyway. Um, what was the question? <laughs> Mental health and power. So for me, it's like everything I do in the soul pod is becoming the best version of yourself. So you can then be the best version of whatever it is you do. And I think it's important to acknowledge in our culture that if you don't want to be an entrepreneur, that's totally okay. If you love your job and you enjoy what you're a part of and you enjoy the security of a paycheck or benefits and the people you're doing it with, that's awesome. So entrepreneurship, is only the, the vehicle if you want it to be. And what I've been able to do with the people that work alongside me is, I'll give a quick example. One of my agents, when I used to actually run my real estate team, I could not understand why he would not sell two houses a month. I'm like, dude, you can do this and you're gonna make 300 grand a year. 
sell two houses a month. Here's the roadmap. And then when I sat down with him, I found out he wants to make 65 grand a year and run ultra marathons. And I was like, oh, he doesn't, I was holding him to a standard that didn't fit him. And then now I wasn't beating him up anymore for not selling two houses a month. I was like, Hey, here's the good news. Let's reverse engineer the math. You need to sell like seven houses this year. You can make your goal and run all you want in the mountains. So I think get in touch with your people one-on-one, -on -one, understand what motivates them. And you will find that not everyone is like me saying like, how do I go make 300, 500, a million, 2 million, sell the company at Walmart. Some people just want to go run in the mountains. And I always envy people that want to run in the mountains, all, all kidding aside. But I always tell people, my job is to take care of you so you can take care of others. I mean, we're in healthcare. And so I call employees every day and just check in with them, touch base with them. And it pays off because I get a lot of information. They know they can pick up the phone and call me anytime. Uh, and they know that someone's if someone has their back and is caring for them. We pay for college education for anybody in our company that wants to go back to school. And so it really anything, come on over, buddy. Anything we can do, anything we can do to further our employees, it ultimately comes back and pays off in dividends. All right, so we got a couple more. Uh, if there was anybody else in the room that had a question, please let me know. We'll continue as well. Uh, Talia, this is actually a good one. We might have to call Mike up, but how do you process a major decision, whether it be a collaboration or canceling a collaboration? So when you're looking at working with someone, which is kind of our next question we'll get to, but how do you process a major decision? Uh, and what are the kind of decision points you make of risk and risk aversion? So for me, I, uh, I tend to always think things are going to work. So I have employed people who are very analytical and their job is to poke holes and see if it still floats. And they're kind of a filter for, cause like literally I'll say yes to everything. So I've had to put these booby traps in my life that can help me say no and help me analytically understand things better. I think I have a high EQ, like a, an emotional intelligence, but my IQ is like, not strong. <laughs> so I just employ the people who are super smart and they'll tell me like, temp, that's a bad idea. And sometimes I still do it or sometimes I don't, but at least I put myself in a position to have the data to make a good decision. I'm an eternal optimist. I always think things are going to work. I am analytical though. So I will go through all the, all the, all the hedges. What happens if this doesn't work? What's my backup plan? I do all that. And sometimes I think, you know what, this probably would be a really cool idea, but I've got no backup plan for it and I'll scrap it. Another quick thought on that is, do I have the bandwidth to take it on? I kind of have non-negotiables with my wife and kids, like they're priority number one. And if it's going to steal my time and I can't figure out how to fit it in through leverage, then it's a no. Um, I appreciate that. And that's a part of leadership. And that's making sure your people know you practice what you preach. And I, as a friend, I, I do see that and I applaud you. And John, I don't know how to get in touch with you. And that's kind of this next, this question is kind of my question is like, how do we get coffee with John? Because it sounds like getting coffee with John is something that Templeton's going to ask for too. So I just want to make sure we get the priority, the, the power rankings here straight. But for everyone in the room, this question kind of comes back to one, how do we work with you or support you? Two, how do we get in touch and, and what, what can we expect? So I, again, my family is like priority number one and uh, social media is big uh, in this day and age. And I've taken full advantage of that. And there's no way that I can get to everybody, right? Like I, I'll be honest, I don't go take the random coffee anymore as much as I want to, because that means if I'm saying yes to that, I'm saying no, probably to my new daughters, my wife, my kids, my health, my priorities. And I found myself at a certain point saying yes to everything. And then I was saying no to the really good stuff. So um, I think through a community platform like this, uh, showing up, listening to what we have to say today, uh, to get a hold of me, you know, Instagram is probably the best way. And I always try to do my best to get back to DMs and answer questions. Um, but intentionally, and again, you got to fill your cup first. I'm pretty hard to get these days just because I'm so committed as a dad and a husband, um, that the best way to get me is to bring me a real estate deal, lead with value. <laughs> like, honestly, that's the truth. Like if you guys want to get in someone's world, figure out what makes them tick. And I bet you, they answer your call but it, it gets tough and I don't mean to be, I'm by no means special, but if you say, Hey, Tim, can I pick your brain over lunch? That's going to be hard. I probably don't have the time. Yeah. But if you say, Hey, Temp, I have this deal that, you know, had a fire and the seller doesn't know what to do with it. I'm probably like calling you right away. Like, Hey, tell me about the deal.
Call 911 and come see me in the emergency department. <laughs> you have my, you have my undivided attention. I, I actually, what, you know, I think Templin just echoed Tim Ferriss, which I still have a lot to learn about is basically being able to say no more than I do. So I'm actually easy to get a hold of. And I, I'm in the process of starting the venture capital fund with the whole idea of supporting entrepreneurs. And so I, I like the engagement because I always learn something. I probably say yes more than I should. But if you really want to see me, St. Joe's, chest pain, you're in. <laughs> Okay. Well, I appreciate it. And so Instagram, the best way um, for, for any businesses out there, I know you do some consulting. So, you know, talk about your books, where can your books be found? And then what kind of consulting do you do? And, and talk about those offerings too. So I do a, a lot of, a lot of startup consulting, a lot of entrepreneurial consulting. My books are at John Schufeld, Um, And they're not all that good to be honest with you. I mean, I, they're, they're a passion project for me, but there's some funny stories and maybe a tip or two in there that you could grab something out of, but you heard most of it in here. How about that for a salesperson? Yeah. <laughs> and Zach, you know what I'll do? And, and this could be super valuable or not valuable, however you look at it. But um, I'll, I'll do an hour lunch with someone that's maybe we could give it away or something. Just to give you perspective, I used to charge $2,500 for a month of coaching and you'd get two 30 minute phone calls. Um, so whether that was valuable or not, people were paying it. Um, so, but if, <laughs> no, so if, uh, I'd be willing to to sit down with someone and have a lunch or to look at their business. I mean, really, you should probably just have the chest pain. You're going to get better advice. But um, I'd love to help in that way. And I could do that one time with someone if we could give it away. Yeah, cool. Awesome. And I, I wanted to ask that, and it's, that's the part of the accessibility and the lunch is great and, and the books are great and the consulting is, I, I hope you guys will continue to be a part of the State 48 family. We'd love to have you at more great events. Um, I know with, with Mike and with Chloe and our entire board and, and this is just the beginning of, of the stories we want to tell. And I can't wait for a month from now, uh, Q1 2022, maybe this time next year, the incubator that will have grown because of the, the stories from folks like you. And um, thank you into your family and thank you to all your employees. Thank you for everything you've done for this community. You talk about telehealth and the founder of telehealth to some degree is right here in our community. Like think about that from an entrepreneur saw this vision 10 years ago that made our community ready to respond at a time like this. That to me is what entrepreneurship truly is. So to everyone in this room, um, thank you so, so, so very much again. Um, everybody at EIC Agency for putting this online. We're going to get this out and we're going to get back into public spaces. Mike and Nick, thank you for believing in me. Vanessa, thank you so much. Oh, we've got a bonus. So we got a little bonus here. Awesome. So just so you know, everyone here at CEI is going to do a bonus session next week. Um, They've been incredible. The space is great. If you haven't been in downtown Phoenix in a while, make some time, come downtown, plan a coffee, plan a Friday night or first Friday. Um, root on your sons. I can't wait to see if the Mercury are winning tonight. I want to look on that. But there's a bonus session uh, next week. Uh, they'll be honing, hosting a Lean Canvas workshop uh, from 6 to 7 on Zoom uh, for all the participants here. So uh, it's a great tool for visualizing your business and bringing your model to life. So uh, check your email for the registration link. Again, bonus session. Thank you. Next week on the Zoom. So check for that link. Um, was that? Survey. Awesome. Look at this. Accountability. See, I work for the man. <laughs> I'm still working for the man. Um, don't forget, fill out the surveys. We want to know what you thought about this, things you'd like to do. Um, how can we offer more? Um, we're going to get with Mike. We're going to figure out what the next series is. But again, like the gratitude can't be any higher for everyone that's taking the time to be here. So to everyone in the room, round of applause again. Thank you guys for taking time out of your lives. Spank EIC, we appreciate you. Good luck to all the entrepreneurs here, and uh, we'll see you guys soon.